if I have a town and a bunch of people start moving to my town and they're bringing their cultural stuff, I don't have any fear that they're going to kill off my culture mm -hmm. because anything that's worth value to me, I'm going to protect anyway. And I, I advocate for the, for the freedom for them to engage in and support and value their culture right up to the extent that it impedes on right. the, the secular, reasonable, Absolutely. scientific founded you know, laws yeah. and things it's like that. It's like a boundary beating. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you've got to beat these boundaries quite hard, allow a lot to go on within it. But, but yes, and once certain lines are crossed, you've got to, you've got to take a, a stronger view on it. That, 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 by the way, I mean, I hark on about it. It may not be of much interest, but this is why France obsesses me, because within one year, they had the massacre that Charlie Hebdo, the most satirical, uh, secular, atheist paper, they had the massacre of most of the staff of that magazine, and also a, a priest beheaded at the altar in Rouen as he was saying mass. If that extremity of things can happen in a culture in quite a short space of time, that is, that is the sort of thing that would return you to the fundamental questions. And as I say, one of the fundamental questions all the time is, is what we have the sort of natural default position of humankind, or is it a pretty unusual thing caused by quite unusual factors? Uh, and I, at any rate, take the second view and therefore think that from the secular tradition and others, you've, just, you've got to be aware of it, at the very least, to make sure you don't piss it away. I think, I think one of the things that, uh, this is another difference from you know, two sides of the pond, uh, and we talked about this very briefly, is that people will contact me on the show and say, oh, you spend all your time talking about Christianity. That's all you talk about, Christianity. Christianity, why would you do that? Because it's a call-in show, and that's what people are calling in about. Uh, first of all, it's also my background. Well, you don't, you don't talk to us about Islam at all. I was like, well, actually, we have many, many times, and mm. uh, there are occasionally Muslim callers. Uh, there's one of them who I'm fairly sure I, I made cry, even though that wasn't my intent. Um, but we address those things, and yet the thing that I keep trying to point out to people is that while I might agree that when it comes to religions worldwide, Islam might be the single most have the, the single most dangerous ideas and, yeah. and be the greatest risk worldwide. But that doesn't mean it's the greatest risk in the United States sure. or in Texas or in Austin. Sure. And you've spoken a, a, a great deal about um, Islam. And I think that there are different things going on in the UK that we don't see here. I sure. mean, Muslims in the United States, I mean, apart from the general fear that has been instilled in everybody, which I have, I think, is at least exaggerated for us, um, but I couldn't say that for everybody. There's, there are Muslims in Dearborn that are, you know, drinking and getting tattoos, and, and you know, they've been, that, their version of Islam has been uh, poisoned, probably for the good, by the, mm. the secular and perhaps even Christian culture that they're surrounded by. I once, I once uh, was with a pretty devout Muslim friend, and He'd been fasting for Ramadan, and he broke the fast with me in a pub with a pint of beer. So I thought it was a, a happy meshing of cultures. And so when we see these changes, and, and granted, yeah. I don't know, and, and you're free to tell us what we don't know about how things are, are much more in conflict with, with regard to people trying to impose their version of Sharia law yeah. in conflict with UK laws. And yeah, there is, there is some of that. And... Um, it, some of it's exaggerated, but a lot of it is, is real and is there. And I mean, I, I give the example of you know, the de facto blasphemy law that now exists across Europe. Um, I, I mean, it's not just Charlie Hebdo. Uh, I mean, quite a number of colleagues and, uh, and friends have been shot at in recent years for, for blaspheming Islam. And uh, that's in, in 21st century Europe. And it, it's it's something which I, at any rate, and a number of other people refuse to shut up about because we think it's intolerable that that should be the situation. And the oddity of that is that, you know, um, if, you, if, if there were to be anyone who decided to kill Michael Palin tomorrow because of the life of Brian, I strongly urge this is not something I think should happen. Yes. Um, but 
if that were to happen, we just you, you, the whole culture, everything would would turn on whoever did that. There would be no ifing and butting. There'd be no kind of well, you've got to understand the offence he caused. You know, we just we'd just be saying no. And that that isn't the case with this other religion in this situation. Partly because people are worried about uh, allegations of bigotry. Partly because they're worried that you know it's kind of punching down and uh, one of the motifs of the time on this, and that you might be upsetting a beleaguered minority and so on. But a third of UK Muslims polled after the Charlie Hebdo attacks said that they had some sympathy with the attackers. A third. Um, you know, I happen to be gay, and uh, you know, I, I'm not delighted by some of the uh, uh, attitudes you can still hear from churches here about homosexuality. But you know, in my own country, there was a poll in 2009 that found among British Muslims, zero percent thought that you should be tolerant towards homosexuality. And a poll taken two years ago found that the majority of British Muslims wanted being gay to be made illegal now. So that's the sort of thing where you start to, you just start to worry. Okay, we've seen this off from one direction. What if, what if it comes in another? And what if it benefits and gains from the fact that people are basically not primed to deal with it anymore? There's a, there's a documentary on uh, Netflix, because I watch tons of documentaries on Netflix, especially when I'm on the road. Um, and it's called Welcome to Leith. And it is about a bunch of Nazis or neo-Nazis who moved to a town somewhere in, I don't know, Wyoming, Montana, someplace, and essentially tried to take it over. Right. And it's really eye-opening because it makes you wonder, well, what would happen if they tried to do this in my town? Now, it would take a lot of them to take over, you know, Austin or New York or whatever. Mm. But in a small town, if you had a, a massive group of people show up, with a particularly dangerous ideology, mm. such that they could actually take over the city council, that they would become the dominant voting bloc. Right. What protections do you have? Right. In this case, um, I, I'm interested in, in, and we're looking at exploring this as a project, there are a number of towns that have been taken over by religious ideologies. There right. are towns that are almost exclusively Mormon or Hasidic Jew, and I have concerns about the constitutional rights right. of the individuals who live in those towns, sure. because the, the, in the in the states the default is, oh well that you know they, you really can't have any power, you know because we've got the constitution right. and it's there to protect us, and uh, as a reminder you, you can in fact run for office anywhere in the United States if you're an atheist, please stop spreading around that thing of right. my state constitution says you must believe, yes, that was all settled by the Supreme Court in the 50s and then fought a couple other times as well, but you can run for office. Mm -hmm. But we had to fight it in court just yeah. to show what the constitution says. Yeah. And if they could take over a town, mm -hmm. I get why people are terrified of that. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be a, a, a more practical solution? I don't know how this applies in, in the UK, but to just make sure that our laws are such yeah. that people can exercise their religious freedom, but they can't, you know, th there's the old joke about the, the Constitution, two, two wolves and a sheep are arguing over what's for dinner, sure. and the Constitution, or the democracy is what allows them all to vote, and the Constitution is what guarantees that the sheep's not going to be dinner. Yeah. And it, it seems that we can enforce those ideas so that people can have their preferred culture, provided it's... Con it can coexist yeah. with the surroundings. Yeah, the, 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 moment, the moment that that's what we're really struggling with across Europe at the moment is, is to work out where the, where the moments are where you tread over the rights of others in a way that's unacceptable and also then what you do about it. Because this is, you know, it's a dialogue of the demented at the moment where um, society says, you know, there are some things we really strongly believe in and if you don't believe in them well, please do it, you know it's not it's not very assertively made there's a sort of well what happens if I don't well please do you, 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 there's no follow-up it starts to look like war and conflict and physical violence ends up being inevitable if you can't yeah come to a reasonable 
Yes, and some people do fear that's the case. I, I, I don't take as apocalyptic a view as that, but um, we, we, there's a long way for this to run, and it doesn't all go in a good direction. <laughs>